The millions of years that led to the modern day assemblage of whale, dolphin and porpoise species encapsulates a truly incredible period of mammalian evolution, or even of any vertebrate evolution. The transformation from small terrestrial hoofed organisms to the largest animals to ever have existed required immense changes to the morphology and behaviour of cetaceans, much of which can be observed in the fossil record of these animals. Evidence for how cetaceans evolved and what they evolved from is not only obtained from their physical remains, but in more recent years data from molecular studies have also been utilised to create phylogenetic reconstructions for these organisms. In these videos, we will be reviewing what is currently known about the evolutionary history of cetacea, as well as examining the relationships this clade has to other closely related mammals. In addition, we'll look at the biology and taxonomy of the evolutionary groups within the three main cetacean clades, the archaeocetes, odontocetes, and the mystocetes. To investigate the origins of this magnificent animal group, we must first look at some of the earliest organisms considered part of Cetacea, in addition to a group that has been recovered as the sister clade to Cetacea, the Rayoelids. Rayoelidae, which is comprised of 10 species in 6 genera, were a group of small-bodied artiodactyls that inhabited southern Asia during the Eocene Epoch. A 2007 study published in the journal Nature examined a specimen of the Rayoella taxon Indohyus, coming to the conclusion that this animal was actually very similar to cetaceans in various ways. The structure of this creature's teeth and ear bones demonstrate its affiliation with cetacea, and levels of stable oxygen isotopes present in preserved enamel, in addition to dense limb bones, support Indohyus as having had an aquatic lifestyle to some extent. This 2007 study therefore recovered Rayoelidae as the sister group to Cetacea, providing a kind of missing link to the whales, and giving some more context as to what sort of animals they are, which we'll discuss in more detail later. Next, let's look at the most basal of all the groups included within Cetacea, the Pachycetids. Pachycetidae consists of three different genera, Ichthyolestes, Nalacetus, and the namesake of the group, Pachycetus. These animals were found in fluvial deposits of around 50 million years old in South Asia, and this kind of environment therefore hints at adaptation towards an aquatic lifestyle, as do other features such as dense limb bones and orbits positioned near the top of the skull. However, the Pachycetidae taxa are interpreted as having been primarily terrestrial archaeocetes that perhaps would have spent some time wading in shallow rivers. Pachycetids possess a number of features that have allowed researchers to better understand the early evolution of Cetacea, including demonstrating how certain cranial features evolved differently in the time since their Rayoelid ancestors. Despite both groups likely having spent time wading in water, Pachycetids were doing things very differently to the Rayoelids, with their teeth and tooth wear indicating a diet of fish, and in addition, a narrow post-orbital skull indicating a different way of sensing the environment and processing food. In short, these animals, which look very different to modern cetaceans, were clearly already becoming adapted to an aquatic lifestyle, with significant changes occurring in their lineage affecting how Pachycetids were behaving compared to the Rayoelids. Even at this very early stage in cetacean evolution, hints at what the future would bring for this clade were appearing in its first members. This brings us to the next point of examination, the main evolutionary radiations that Cetacea underwent. The first of the two most notable radiations occurred when the terrestrial organisms that whales descended from, such as the Pachycetids, first began to take to the waters and radiated into several different archaeocete groups. As can be deduced from the localities where the fossils were uncovered, this transition seems to have occurred in and around ancient India about 50 million years ago, with this period of evolution taking place over approximately 10 million years, though certain evidence could mean that the period is reduced to only about 4 million years. Clearly this lineage underwent some significant changes during this time in their evolutionary history, with major reshaping of elements such as limbs that were previously adapted for walking on land becoming better suited as paddles to propel the creatures through the water. A good example of the shifts in anatomy that occurred over this early evolutionary radiation can be found by looking at the pelvis and feet of the Archaeocetes, Ambulocetus, and Myocetus. Ambulocetus possessed fairly large feet, suggesting that they were used to propel the animal through the water by flexing the entire spine and hind limbs together, a kind of transitional method between paddling like more ancient whales and using a hydrofoil like modern taxa do. 
In Myocetus, a more derived arcuocete than ambulocetus, an examination of the pelvis reveals that it was not fully connected to the vertebral column, indicating that the spine probably had greater flexibility in this taxon, allowing Myocetus to propel itself by flexing the posterior part of its body up and down, more similar to how cetaceans today move. In about 10 million years, or possibly shorter, early arcuocete whales had become better adapted for a fully aquatic lifestyle, leaving their previous environments and radiating out into a myriad of different niches, certain occupants of which would eventually lead to the largest organisms to live on this planet. The other main radiation within Cetacea occurred much later than the first, with Crown Cetacea, also called Neocete, having separated from the Archaeocetes about 36 million years ago. Soon after Neocete became a distinct lineage, they began to spread around the world's oceans, and were even going back to inhabiting rivers and estuaries. A 2009 study examined possible causes for the radiation that occurred within Crown Cetacea, and it found that the event probably had a lot to do with how the physical shape of the world's oceans was changing during this time. The period of increased rate of diversification amongst Neocetes occurred during ages when the ocean was undergoing major physical restructuring, for example certain seaways closing and others opening up. This would seem to suggest that such eras of dramatic paleogeographic shifts had a significant role to play in the second cetacean radiation, having a large influence over the modern assemblage of taxa we see around us today. This period of radiation saw the diverging of the two main neocete clades, the filter-feeding mysticetes and the toothed echolocating odontocetes. According to that same 2009 paper, echolocating first evolved in odontocetes approximately 36 to 34 million years ago, and so it seems likely that this is when the two neocete clades would have separated, each lineage leading to a great deal of diverse and distinct forms of their own. Figuring out exactly where cetaceans fit within the rest of the great tree of life has historically been a convoluted task. Despite living in the water, possessing fins, and being hairless, cetaceans are not fish, as it was long thought in ancient times before Aristotle noticed several mammalian characteristics. Cetaceans are indeed mammals, as numerous different features demonstrate, but what sort of mammal they are has also been a perplexing question. Cetacea had generally been accepted as being very closely related to an extinct mammal clade called Mesonychia, ever since this association was first proposed in 1966. Mesonychians were carnivorous, fairly unusual looking animals, with the rough overall body shape of a wolf, yet also possessing small hooves on the ends of each of the five toes present on every foot. The evidence in favour of a cetacea mesonychia association was good, since the teeth of Mesonychians were very similar in structure to the teeth of early Archaeocetes. Mesonychia has a large fossil record too, with relatively complete skeletons known from across the world, including Europe, Asia, and North America, which provided good samples for the animals, and they also lived at exactly the right time in Earth's history to have been ancestral to Cetacea. So, in 1975, Cetacea and Mesonychia were placed as sister groups together in a clade named Seat, with good support from dental characters, as well as some basic cranial ones. However, this is not how things are today. Some very controversial discoveries eventually caused cetaceous placement within mammals to change significantly, taking them away from Mesonychia and placing them with a completely different group. The first evidence contradicting the Mesonychian association came from molecular studies performed in the 90s, which discovered signals in the genes of living whales that had some very interesting evolutionary implications. Looking at the proteins and DNA of these animals, various researchers discovered that extant whales are actually very similar to artiodactyls, and, even more specifically, that whales should be placed as a sister group to hippos. However, this was not convincing enough evidence for some paleontologists, especially since the fossil and morphological data seemed to still support a relation with Mesonychians. But as the years went on, more and more independent researchers uncovered the same genetic signals that united whales and hippos, and then, in 2001, the morphological evidence was found. One of the reasons that cetaceans had not been included as artiodactyls when just considering the paleontological data had been due to the morphology of the ankle bone called the astragalus. All members of Artiodactyla have a condition of the astragalus whereby they are double trocleated, meaning they have a double pulley appearance. However, Mesonychians did not have this kind of astragalus, and since cetaceans were considered relatives of Mesonychia, they were not previously considered artiodactyls. The problem with living whales is that they've lost their hind limbs, and so have many species known only from fossils, and so their ankle bones could not be examined to solve this. 
With ancient arcuseats that did possess hind limbs, not enough material from the right areas was known, and so the astragalus condition in cetaceans remained a mystery for a long time. That's why the 2001 discoveries of not one, but two different arcuseat ankles was so significant in further clarifying whale evolution. Remarkably, two groups of researchers announced both of these discoveries in the same week, with one publishing on a proto-seated ankle and the others on a pachy-seated ankle. And, sure enough, these arcuoceats both possessed ankles that displayed the distinctive artiodactyl condition, finally providing some good morphological evidence in favour of a cetacean artiodactyl relationship. Coupled with the strong molecular data, and in addition to the later discovery of the Rayoelid association with Cetacea, it's widely accepted today that whales are artiodactyl mammals. Now that we've looked at how Cetacea as a whole fits into the mammalian lineage, let's examine its internal relationships between clades. Starting with the most basal group of Cetaceans, the Archaeocetes, this clade is made up of five different families. The previously mentioned Pachycetidae is the most basal member of Archaeocetae, however the first member of Pachycetidae to be described in 1958, Ichthyolestes, was originally thought to be a Mesonychid, before being reassigned to Cetacea in 1980, demonstrating again how a close relationship with Mesonychids was fairly strongly supported by morphological evidence. Pachycetes are all only known from fossils discovered in India and Pakistan, and, as discussed previously, were an integral part of deciphering Cetacean origins. The next most basal group of Archaeocetes is Ambulocetidae, which probably diverged from Pachycetids as they became better adapted for aquatic life. This clade is made up of three genera, Ambulocetus, Gandacasia, and Himalayacetus. Ambulocetus, for which the group gets its name, is a fairly well-known Archaeocete, with the holotype of the species comprising of a skull and nearly complete postcranial skeleton. This animal was also quite a bit bigger than its earlier pachycetid relatives, and seems to have behaved in a comparable way to modern crocodilians, waiting in shallow waters and lunging out at terrestrial animals. This has been determined from the locality of Ambulocetus fossils, which were uncovered in marginal marine deposits, along with the dorsal position of the orbits on the skull, a good adaptation for watching prey while submerged. In addition, evidence from isotopic analyses indicates that Ambulocetus fed on terrestrial creatures. Originating from somewhere within Ambulocetidae comes the next group of Archaeocete cetaceans, Remingtonocetidae. Also known from India and Pakistan, this clade is composed of five different genera. This group seems to have continued the trend of becoming mammalian crocodiles as they have been described, with long skulls and jaws, as well as elongated bodies, giving them a very crocodilian-like appearance. These organisms were still very capable of walking on land, indicated by the morphology of their limbs and other skeletal elements, but isotopic analysis, in addition to the environments their fossils were found in, also illustrate that they spent much time in marine habitats. The next most derived clade of Archaeocetes is Protocetidae, comprising a much larger array of taxa in 16 genera. There are three different subgroups within the Protocetids, including Protocetinae, Makaracetinae, and Georgiacetinae. These prehistoric whales are also known from India and Pakistan, where they likely originated from, but subsequently spread across much of the rest of the world between about 49 to 40 million years ago, with fossils of these creatures uncovered from coastal deposits in Africa, Europe, and the Americas. Pelvic and hind limb material is known for some members of this clade, and they illustrate that many protocetids, with the exception of maybe two species, would still have been capable of walking on land. There seems to have been quite a bit of diversity within Protocetidae, with many distinct variations in ear structure and the length of skulls. However, one feature that the family shares, and that distinguishes them from earlier Archaeocete groups, is the position of the nasal opening. In older Archaeocetes, the nostrils were located near the anterior tip of the skull. However, in Protocetids, they are positioned further back, a feature that eventually led to the evolution of blowholes on the foreheads of living whales, which allows the animals to remain mostly underwater whilst breathing. Protocetids also have much larger eyes compared to more basal Archaeocetes, and they are pointed more laterally on the sides of the skull. 
a genus of protocetine protocetid called Myocetus that was first named and described in 2009 provided some interesting information on how these animals reproduced, as the specimen preserved what was interpreted by the authors as a fetal skeleton within the larger adult skeleton. Based on the orientation of the fetus, which would have been born head first, it was concluded that Myocetus, and therefore other protocetids, probably lived in a similar fashion to modern pinnipeds, spending much of their time in the water, but coming onto land in order to mate and give birth to their offspring. Finally, we come to the most derived grouping of archaeocetes, Basilosauridae. Originating about 41 million years ago in the Middle Eocene and inhabiting every ocean, there are two main groups within this family, Basilosaurinae and Dorodontinae. There's also another group, Cochinodontinae, which includes just one genus, Cochinodon, that has been placed within Basilosauridae in the past. However, this taxon has also been placed as an odontocete and a mystocete, and its true classification is not entirely clear, though apparently some more recent studies have placed Cochinodontinae as a transitional clade between Basilosaurids and Neocetes. The Basilosaurines are notable for having very elongated, almost snake-like bodies, reaching lengths of up to 17 meters. The Dorodontines, on the other hand, were significantly shorter, possessing slightly more dolphin-like bodies. All members of the Basilosauridae family possessed nasal openings that had migrated even further back along the skull, positioned near to the orbits where a blowhole would have been present. In addition, these organisms were the first truly aquatic whales, with highly reduced hind limbs that did not attach to the rest of the skeleton, and forelimbs that were encased in flippers, meaning Basilosaurids would have been unable to support their bodies on land. Furthermore, the pterygoid sinuses around the ears of Basilosaurids were particularly well developed, and it's these sinuses that help extant whales adjust to the changes in pressure when diving, suggesting these archaeocetes were performing similar behaviours underwater. There's also morphological evidence gained from fossils that indicate that these ancient creatures even had tail flukes like today's whales. The very posterior caudal vertebrae are compressed dorsoventrally, a signal that soft tissue tail flukes were almost certainly present in Basilosaurids, and would have played a large part in their locomotion. Previously, it was thought that Basilosaurids had only survived from the Middle Eocene until the Late Eocene, however fossils from New Zealand actually revealed that the group had made it to the Late Oligocene, extending the group's range by some 10 million years. Neocete, the group that includes all of the currently living whales, most probably originated within the Dorodontine Basilosaurids, therefore making Dorodontinae and Basilosauridae paraphyletic clades, as their definitions don't include Neocete. A study published in 2008 erected a clade called Pelagocete to include the ancestors of Basilosaurids and Neocetes and all their descendants, and under this arrangement Basilosauridae would still be a paraphyletic grouping, but it discards the clade Archaeocete, which is also paraphyletic as it does not include Neocete. However, other studies have maintained that since no Archaeocetes-like fossils have ever been placed within Neocete, the evolution of this group can be examined separately to other older whale groups, allowing Archaeocete to remain in use. It should also be noted that Protocetidae is another paraphyletic grouping, as it gave rise to Basilosauridae, but by definition does not include them. So, we've had a look at the early evolution of Cetacea, and the main groups that make up the Archaeocetes. However, I'll have to continue the rest of this examination into whale evolution in another video, for reasons of once again running out of time. In the next episode, we'll carry on looking at the main Cetacean clades, and cover the two currently living groups, the Odontocetes and the Mystocetes. There are loads of fascinating members of both of these clades, so be sure to look out for part 2 when it's finished. I've greatly enjoyed doing all the research for these videos, and learning about my favourite group of living animals and their evolutionary history has been a fantastic experience. I hope you enjoyed this video too, and thank you for watching. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.